Well, it is good to have you with us as we turn to our study now, and great to have those of you who are able to be online with us, live stream or later catching this recording. I have a handout. If you don't have a handout in this room, raise your hand. There are people with the handout. They will get it to you. Everybody got one? We will post this online. Uh, you can catch this online as well. You can also see the handout with the notes from last week's part one study of the 12 articles of our Christian faith set forth in the Apostles' Creed. Tonight, uh, July 26, we are looking at part two of this study. So let's remind ourselves kind of where we are with this. Why do we call something like the Apostles' Creed a creed? And the answer is, as we've talked about before and we talked about last week, comes from the Latin credo. Credo means um, I believe, okay? So, and we believe in, as we talked about last week, we don't just kind of randomly believe things, we believe in God. And the Apostles' Creed sets forth that we believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and then we believe in the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and then we believe in the Holy Ghost, or in other words, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. As we said last week, I won't cover this ground extensively again tonight, but the Apostles' Creed is not something that was set forth you know, in detail as a creedal statement in the first century. It developed over several centuries. It does come from apostolic teaching, and we saw and we'll continue to look at the biblical basis for the Apostles' Creed. The more formal ecumenical creed is the Nicene Creed, in which, by the way, um, so let me remind you, the Apostles' Creed arose out of a baptismal affirmation in the Western Church, or what is commonly called the Roman Church, or the Roman Creed, okay? This is, this is you know, centuries before you get a, a fully developed like Roman, what you would think of as even the medieval Roman Catholic Church. But in the early church, the Roman rite, the Roman baptismal rite um, for baptism, this Apostles' Creed flows out of the development of that over several centuries. So in other words, if you're gonna be baptized, if you're actually gonna be a Christian, you need to be able to say in whom you believe, okay? So the Apostles' Creed reflects that and because there were all kinds of different heresies and teachings and different proposals about Jesus and what it meant to be a Christian, there was a clear set of affirmations that were developed to say, look, if you're an actual biblically based, apostolically linked, you know, apostolic teaching Christian, then you're gonna affirm certain things. Like for instance, um, the resurrection, okay, we don't just, Jesus didn't just float into eternity. We don't just float into eternity. There's actually a resurrection, okay? So all these kind of things are very important. The fact that Jesus was born of a woman, a human woman, who was also a virgin, which has to do with a whole lot of theology about the fact that although he is born of a woman because he's conceived by the Holy Spirit, he is not under the fall. Okay, he's like a second Adam. All, you know, there's a lot of theology that's packed into what you are saying when you profess uh, and confess your faith in the Apostles' Creed. So we'll continue to take a look at some of this tonight. Um, I definitely want to get to um, the third section, so to speak, of the Creed, talking about the Holy Ghost or the Holy Catholic Church and the affirmations that flow out of that. Okay, so. Let's, uh, let's remember this. So in other words, the Nicene Creed says we believe. And as I highlighted last week, it specifically says we believe in two because the Nicene Creed was composed, you know, foundationally in Greek. And in Greek, as I mentioned in the study last week, there's a, there's a clarification, there's a general term um, general preposition, uh, epsilon nu, which is in, and then there's a specific preposition, like we have in English, actually, into. It's, it, it, in, the, in the Greek, it's 
epsilon, iota, sigma, so ace. And like when you're reading John's gospel, which of course is written in Greek, when we're, we're called to, uh, you know, whoever believes in him, okay, this is into language. Because in the New Testament, in the New Testament Greek, the concept is for you to be saved, you must believe into, you must become one with, you must, you know, receive into and be received into a living relationship with Jesus. And the creeds really are reflecting that, okay? Which I'm about to get to from another angle in a minute. But in other words, to affirm these things, you are saying, I believe into. I, I throw myself before. I receive fully. I enter into a relationship with God the Father Almighty, with God the Son, Jesus Christ, uh, with God the Holy Spirit. So let, let's look at part of what was going on uh, with some understanding and some clarification. As I mentioned last time, the Protestant reformers, who again, they were branching off from, splitting off from the Roman church in the West. And again, the Apostles' Creed is specifically something in the West, what would be called the Western church, the Western church that centered around Latin and uh, the, the Roman church, okay? Uh, the Protestant reformers, uh, the, or the magisterial Protestant reformers in the first decade or so of the Protestant Reformation wanted to clarify with respect to faith. What is saving faith? Well, the Protestant reformers spoke in terms of at least three types of or dimensions of what saving faith is. And the first one is definitely not gonna get you anywhere close to saving faith, notitia, okay? And I've got this in your notes so you can follow along. Notitia, ascensus, and fiducia, okay? Notitia, ascensus, and fiducia. Now these are common Latin terms. Notitia uh, means like notice, okay, notice, uh, or acquaintance with information, okay? A census means you, as you can kind of tell from this, this Latin is not that hard now, you assent to, you agree with this, okay? So it's not just I've received the information. Because by the way, I could preach at somebody, you know, uh, sun up, sun down for 18 days. And they could say, yeah, okay, I've learned who the Christians claim Jesus is, and I've heard a lot of the Gospels because this pastor keeps, you know, preaching this stuff at me. Would that mean the person is saved at that point? No, absolutely not. They may, like, write down a bunch of information. If you just write down a bunch of information as I preach, does that save you? What do you think? No way, okay. So, notitia is definitely, it's important. You need to receive the Word of God, right? But, uh, yeah, hear the Word of God. But, but uh, you, you've got to at least get to the point of a census. But you can, uh, you can agree to it, okay? You can agree to it, but it might not change you, Okay? So if I've not only heard the information, and I've got it in my head, but I also say, yeah, I intellectually agree with that. That makes sense to me. Do you think I'm a saved, born-again Christian at that point? No. So in other words, we've got to get to fiducia, which is putting your trust, your confidence, and looking to this for your total credit, okay? So in other words, it's moving in the, in, the, in the direction of receiving the grace of God. So that's fiducia. Uh, the Roman church and the Roman Catholic church thought that the, uh, these Protestants, what they were talking about, um, talking about faith alone or sola fide, was gonna encourage people to live immoral lives and not actually be Christian disciples. And you can see the argument for this. You could say what you're going to raise up, and you actually see this in modern Western history a lot. People who say, oh, yeah, I'll go to church occasionally, and I'll say this stuff, and I'll say I agree with it. But then I'm going to live a, a very immoral life because, by the way, God saves me by grace anyway, so it doesn't matter what I do. I'm not saved by works. So it doesn't matter with whom I sleep, 
what I do with my money, whose money I steal, whatever, because I'm saved by grace anyway, right? I got that message, <laughs> I, get, I get the notitia, and I agree, I have senses with this, right? So I'm all, I'm saved, right? I mean, I came forward when I was 16 and I signed the card. I'm good to go, right? Doesn't matter what I do. You know, the Roman church is like, oh, you're gonna raise up a bunch of people who are theoretical, you know, you know, they intellectually assent to this, but, but it's not, it's, it doesn't make, matter in their lives. This is the concern, right? So the reformers were therefore very careful to say, oh, no, no, we're talking about not just notitia. We're talking about notitia. It's very important. And by the way, the Roman Catholic Church, we think, has messed up a lot of the notitia information that's needed, right? But, um, and not even just a census, not just like, yes, I say the creed, so therefore I'm saved, right? No, 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 not just a census, also fiducia. Um, and they wanted to show, the Protestant reformers wanted to show that true saving faith would always produce fruit. In other words, the kind of faith we're talking about, when you're truly saved by Christ alone, through grace alone, through faith alone, it's going to be a fruitful faith. So you're not going to be saved by your works, but your life is going to be, you know, the Protestants said, look, our people, as they truly come to faith, um, they're, not going to, they're not going to need uh, to, to, to just have rituals. They're going to live out their lives like they're going to be prayer sessions in their homes on a regular basis. Their children are going to actually know the word of God because we're delivering it to them in their own languages. And obviously, fathers and mothers and children will memorize entire segments of the scripture and know what they mean and apply these things. They will live lives of prayer. Uh, Protestant families will devote you know, hours to prayer in their own homes. That's, that was the vision of the Protestant reformers in countervalence to the Roman Catholic Church. Look, all you're gonna do is you're gonna, you're gonna let some people go out and put a cross on their you know, car or whatever, their home, and say they believe in Jesus and then live however they want to and not really know anything of the substance of the scripture, much less putting it into practice. So uh, you can see that both of these arguments have some sting to them, right? But the Protestant reformer said, no, no, no. And so um, the first person who, who noted that we're talking about all three levels when you're talking about Protestant affirmed biblical faith is Philip Melanchthon in his uh, 1521 book, The Loci Communes Theologici. Um, so he, he sets forth this there. And again, the idea is notitia referred to the content of our faith, a census, the conviction that the faith is true. And fiducia refers to personal trust in this gospel, personal trust in God. So in other words, like, you know, you've heard this example from me before, you've heard it from other preachers before, but in other words, I can tell you this is a chair, you know? I can tell you how a chair is made or whatever and draw a diagram of it. That's information, right? I can say, look, this is a chair. Do you believe this is a chair? Do you believe that if I sit in this chair, it will support me? And you can say, yes, we do. At that point, have you put your trust in the chair? No. You would actually have to not only agree that this is a chair, okay, agree that it works. That's just kind of making a creedal confession, you know, with your, with your mouth only, right? you would actually have to come and rely fully on the chair. If I said, well, I kind of I do, but you know, I've got this other leg over here. <laughs> I'm, not really, I'm not really all the way in, am I? So that's what they're talking about. Does that make sense to y'all? Okay, so that's fiducia. Um, now, let me give you a scriptural example of this. So we gotta remember this, when we talk about the Apostles' Creed and when we apply it as biblical Christians, this is not just Yes, I, I can line up all the words, or yes, I intellectually agree to this, but I don't actually live according to it. It's like all three of these things. You need to know what the content is. You need to 
agree to and receive the content, and you actually must, for true justification by faith, actually live it, right? Now, the living doesn't save you, but if you truly believe, you will live it, right? Because that's actual faith. Okay, so let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. This is in your notes. Paul says, and we also thank God um, constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us. Now, you see, that's an otisha. You all see that? I mean, you do need that. You need the word of God. You need to have the information clear, okay? When you receive the word of God, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what, is, what it really is, the word of God. So at that point, you've got a census. Yes, I not only have heard, you know, the Bible read or the preacher talking about the word, I've actually, I've actually agreed that it is God's gospel, that it is the word of God. And then look at this, the word of God, a sense is, which is at work in you believers. So in other words, the word is actually changing you. You're actually the way you live, the way your heart and soul are aligned toward God the way you love God and your neighbor, and for our current like point in Luke, even love, begin to love your enemies. Well, okay. Somebody who actually is you know, alive in the word is a believer. Look at Colossians 2, six through seven. This isn't as simple because it's not in the exact order, but just notice this. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, that would be a census. See that? Colossians 2, 6 and 7. As you therefore receive Christ Jesus as the Lord, so walk in him. Now that's fiducia. That, in other words, is a living faith. Uh, rooted up and built in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, that's notitia, abounding in thanksgiving. Luther, Martin Luther, really wanted to emphasize this, that uh, we're talking about uh, a fides viva, in other words, a living faith. This is not an intellectual head game. We don't come to church to say, oh, I can graph out a little bit more of a Bible verse, or I've memorized a few more verses, or I can tell you some trivia answers to you know where some of the apostles came from that <laughs> that may be nice and helpful but that is not going to save your soul right <laughs> you you it's got to move all the way from information to a life lived in this faith do y'all have questions about that so that's that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the apostles creed bear in mind it's important to understand what the apostles creed is saying but it only matters if it matters in you, like in your life, okay? Um, it, this is not like just, well, I signed the card and I got my insurance policy. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. Okay, so let's pick back up on the Apostles' Creed, the articles of our faith, the 12 articles. And we've already talked about, I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I have lots of scriptural citations if you're watching online in the handout. You can, you can open these up and go into these. Uh, we're not spending in this study, just because we're doing two, two sessions, a lot of time on some things that I think you should be able to just read from the scripture and understand. I will highlight again, though, that like, I mentioned this last time, like with the Nicene Creed, so also in the Apostles' Creed, there is a significant emphasis on the fact that God made earth as well as heaven. There's not a division going on. God, yes, the earth, yes, the world is fallen, but God didn't make a fallen world, okay, number one. And number two, there's not some, you know, the true God is not above and beyond and out of this world only. He's the maker of earth as well as heaven. In fact, he makes human beings from the earth. I mean, that's right there in Genesis chapter 2. We're made from the dirt. 
We're dirt people, okay? And, but God is going to redeem. God is going to redeem the dirt, so to speak. He's going to redeem heaven and earth and make a new heaven and earth in Jesus. Okay, so uh, Article 2, of course, Jesus Christ. I talked about this pretty extensively last time. You know, folks who say, oh, I don't, I don't have any creed. I don't need any creed. First of all, everybody who reads the Bible, you're going to have some points of reference to the way you read the Bible, number one. Number two, the Bible is full of creedal statements, including the most basic Christian one that we talked about last time, which would be, you know, like the baby version, the prelude is Jesus Christ, which is a creedal statement. You're saying that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He's the Christ. You just made a creedal statement. If you combine the name Jesus with the title Christ, you've already made a creedal statement. And then number two, the most basic kind of foundational one, the essential one for Christians is Jesus Christ is Lord. Once you've said he's Lord, you have made a creedal statement for sure. And Paul says, um, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, that's in Romans 10. And Paul is basically saying, in other words, let's give a creedal point of reference to salvation. I mean, you hear that, right? <laughs> If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We looked at this last week. I'm not going to go back to it heavily, but remember, if, if, if foundational, Paul's got this like right in the middle of Romans 10, uh, God raised Jesus from the dead. So if you want to start playing games about how, well, Jesus wasn't really ever in the dead, how do you, how do you, you're going to have to strike out that key, you know, that key criteria uh, from Paul right there in Romans 10. That's, uh, that's an interesting game to play, particularly for people who write as Protestants, okay? So um, I've already addressed that last time. You, you heard my concern with uh, what I would consider kind of overstretched arguments on the, um, that Jesus indeed rose from the dead, or in other words, from the place of the dead, from among the dead. He rose from the dead. He died, and he was with the dead, and he rose from the dead. Um, Paul says uh, you need to believe that in your heart in connection with salvation. So I'm going to go with Paul on that. That's just my, that's my personal stance. Anybody have any concern with that? Okay. All right, so... Um, then let's go on to, uh, let me go to something else about Jesus that I really wanted to highlight for you. Now, notice this. In the Apostles' Creed, and if you've never thought about this, then you're just not thinking when you're saying the Apostles' Creed. So let me get you guys thinking a little bit. Okay, so conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate. Is that the way the Gospels are written? Do we open with Christmas and then basically we go immediately to Good Friday and Easter in the Gospels? Is that what happens in the Gospels? No. You've got all kinds of chapters about Jesus and his earthly ministry, right? In Luke, you have about his childhood a little bit, right? Before he even becomes an adult. So, why doesn't the Creed talk about the miracles, some of the teachings, those types of things. And so now, now I've got you thinking about something some of y'all haven't thought about before, right? Um, so let me just tell you that uh, the, the understanding of the creed is, look, we need to look to the basics, okay? This isn't the full fleshed out. You've got the Bible for the full fleshed out, but we need to go to the basic markers for what distinguishes the gospel the salvific atoning gospel, and also what distinguishes biblical, orthodox, apostolic type Christians from heretics. Okay, so um, what I want to highlight for you is the fact that the creed is particularly focusing on the fact that we have a historically fixed atonement by Jesus. 
Jesus not only was born as a human being, born, conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, into human history, he dies specifically in history as the atoning sacrifice. It's not a theory, he's not a theoretical lamb. It's not God just kind of thought of this and so therefore it happened even though it never really happened on earth. It happened in history. And it happened specifically under Rome and under the representative of the Roman Empire, a guy named Pontius Pilate. The scriptures testified in Isaiah, the Lord's word through Isaiah specifically prophesies a whole lot about this, that Jesus must suffer. When Jesus sums up why he's come, he tells his disciples over and over again, and he, he tells them after he's risen, did you not understand that the Messiah must suffer, must suffer at the hands of men, and then die, okay? So by the way, it's important to understand that Jesus not only simply dies, he suffered, fulfilling all kinds of prophecy in our place, okay? And he suffered specifically under Pontius Pilate. And we know that Pontius Pilate is the, well, to use kind of a broad term, it's not the specific term, but he's the governor, okay, of Palestine uh, from uh, the late 20s through the late 30s. So you are damp, you're date stamping this, this situation here. When you profess this, when you confess this, he suffered, and he specifically suffered under a state authority of the Roman Empire called Pontius Pilate. I thought he suffered in death. Okay, we Reed addressed that in the study, so let me refer you to, he did not suffer, we, we, we do not believe he suffered in hell. His suffering was completed on the cross, okay? So in other words, Jesus was not in Gehenna in his death, June. Uh, June is asking, if you're watching online, June is asking about Jesus. Go back to the July 5th study by Reed or to my briefer study in part one of this. I addressed this a little bit last week, but remember, Jesus says as he prepares to die on the cross, as he approaches death on the cross, he says to tell us die, it is finished, okay? So the suffering atoning work of Jesus is completed as he dies on the cross. Does everybody understand that? June, that should answer your question. He does not suffer in hell. He does go to the dead, though. I, we believe, we, 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 in other words, um, Reed and I have talked about that. We don't think that fray or that clause should come out of the Apostles' Creed. We're not taking it out next week in the service or something like that. There's, there's reasons to have that in there, but it needs to be properly understood because he does not, uh, we do not believe, we strongly uh, would disagree, June, with what would be considered by most theologians the heretical proposition that Jesus further suffered in hell because it's completed on the cross as far as the suffering, which is why, by the way, back to the creed, the creed says, notice, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. It doesn't say he suffered under Pontius Pilate and um, somebody else. You know, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, uh, was crucified, dead, and buried, okay? Let me move on to some other ones, unless y'all have any further questions. Does anybody else have a question about the suffering in? Okay. Okay, all right. You and I will talk about this later, but he, there is no biblical warrant. There's nothing that you can find in Scripture that, uh, well, okay, we, I, I, right. Let me send you back to, Reed spent like an hour on this on July 5th, so I'll, I'll send you back to that. I talked about it a little bit last time. Let me move on to make sure we get to some later parts. So June, we'll, we'll get you connected on that. Um, the third day he rose again from the dead, which we've already said is central biblical affirmation. Paul makes that very clear. He rose again from the dead and he ascended into heaven. Uh, there's lots of scripture on this and then this connects, Article 6 is, he ascended into heaven. Well, what did he do? What's the deal with he ascended into heaven? And sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. This is a huge affirmation. 
I want to encourage you, I've preached on this before. You can go back in the sermon archives and find this where I've really emphasized this. Um, I believe I did it in a sermon just uh, last year before we started Luke. Uh, but it's really important to embrace this, that Jesus is our mediator and our advocate at the right hand of the Father, that by, by it, the scripture is replete with this, that Jesus as the Son of Man and as the justified Son of God is God himself, which is he is able to, like in Revelation, right? No one can approach the throne of God and take the scroll and release the seals. Y'all remember this, right? But suddenly someone can. Who is that? It's this lamb who was slain who, because by, let me make this clear. No one except someone who is divine could approach the almighty and take a scroll from him. Does everybody understand this? Nobody except somebody who is divine sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. So when you say Jesus ascended to heaven, what this is saying is he's not only just generally in heaven, he is in the throne room and he approaches the Father and is welcomed by the Father as the divine son, okay? This is not even like an archangel who stands in the presence of God. This is Jesus, the Son of God, who comes to the Father, sits at the right hand of the Father, co-reigning with the Father. When you say this, he ascended into heaven, you're saying huge things about who Jesus is, number one. And number two, you're saying huge words of assurance about how he acts on our behalf. Let me take you to just some, a few of the obvious passages of this. Um, let me go to, well, let's go to Romans 8, 34, since I've been doing a lot of Romans with this study. This is very brief, but this is going to tell you. You know, this is, Paul's rhetorically asking these questions like, you know, how can, how can we know there's no condemnation for everybody who believes in Jesus? How can you know that when you die and when you appear before God, you will not be condemned? Because you are a sinner, right? So how can you know this? Well, look at this. Um, in, in the process of answering that question, Paul says this in Romans 8, 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus, the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Do y'all see that? Jesus at the right hand of God is advocating for everybody who belongs to him. He's advocating for you. When God the Father looks at you sinning and stumbling, when you belong to Jesus, Jesus says, Father, he's one of mine. She's one of mine. She's covered by my atonement. I mean, isn't that awesome? He's at the right hand interceding for us. So that's a huge statement. He ascended into heaven. I already kind of gave you the general idea of how huge this is about his divinity, right, and clarifying his divinity. But on top of that, right, he's interceding for He's your advocate. Like, you, you don't have to, like, well, maybe I might get kind of, I don't know, Gabriel interceding. No, 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 don't go that low. I mean, Gabriel's pretty cool, but he's nothing compared to having the Son of God who died for our sin interceding for you. And that's what that just said. Um, so look at a couple other ones related to this. Um, let's go, let's, I'll just go backwards in my citations here. 1 Peter 3, 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
who has gone into heaven. Do y'all see that? Has gone into heaven. That's the ascension into heaven. And is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Everything's under his authority. And he is there at the right hand on our behalf, amazingly enough. This is incredible. Okay, now, um, let us move on to from thence he shall come to judge the quick. That's old English language for, that, that's not, I know Westerns are called that, but that's not talking about how fast you draw a gun. The quick, that means the living um, and the dead. Let's talk about the judgment of Jesus for a moment. Uh, let's go over to John's gospel. Because this, this also connects with the resurrection as well. John chapter 5. Let me just sweep through uh, several, several verses here. I'll pick up at um, verse 21, John 5, 21. Jesus is, is teaching. He's speaking here. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So in other words, you can't say, well, I'm just not into Jesus, but I'm really into God. It's like Jesus just told you, like, you, you don't get this. Not, <laughs> you, you don't get, get to go before the judgment and say, well, I just didn't like Jesus, you know, because I was into, like, strict monotheism. So I'm just, it's like, no, no, no. If you don't honor Jesus, because remember, he's one with God, right? He's at the right hand of the Father. Okay. Um, so whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, in other words, the Father, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Amen, amen, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear, in other words, in the sense of actually, you know, like really hearing, like really believing, those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. That's Daniel 7, 13 and 14 there. He is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So everyone is going to be judged. Everyone is going to have a resurrection. Sometimes some... some like kind of uninformed Christians say, well, the Christians are raised. No, everybody's raised. The question is your, it's not your resurrection, it's your destination, right? <laughs> you want to be in the resurrection unto life. And that's people who believe in the Son, who will execute the judgment. Got it? So, like, when you say uh, that he will come again, to judge the living and the dead. That means every living person, every dead person. It's not like a small minority that Jesus addresses. He addresses everyone. Is this comprehensive? Yes, this is comprehensive. Okay, so, and again, you see the scriptural, there's all kinds of scripture about this, but Jesus' statement in John chapter 5 is pretty, it's, that's hard to miss, right, what he's saying there. Um, he shall come again to judge the quick and the dead. Let me give you a few more of these. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, let's 
Yeah, let's go to 2 Timothy 3. Excuse me, 2 Peter 3. I'm sorry, 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. Sometimes folks don't read 2 Peter that often. It's, it's a very important book in the canon. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Now, this is a very important passage for us in the 21st century. Okay? Um, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perish. But, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, this is, in other words, the idea like you don't know when it's going to come. Uh, a good thief, in other words, a, a stealthy thief, okay, will come like a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth, Isaiah, right, 66, uh, new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. So uh, that's, that's the context. Now, of course, that then segues us into uh, the work of and our faith in the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. You see how this flows, right? As, as we understand that we need to be prepared for the return of the Lord and that we will all come before the Lord in judgment, then we're called to be people of the Holy Spirit, led by, transformed by Christ's righteousness, not only um, imputed to us, but also at work within us. So again, we have the fiducia that I was talking about earlier. We're actually living in faith. Okay, so uh, I believe in the Holy Ghost, um, the Holy Spirit. I've had all kinds of citations. I could have gone on for pages about the Holy Spirit, but you see the scriptural citations there. I believe in the Holy Ghost, and then notice this: the Holy Catholic Church. Okay, what are we talking about there? Make sure I get to this, and I'll come back to it. Catholic, remember, in the Latin, Catholica, and in the Greek, means universal. And what that's going to mean is across all temporal, spatial, cultural context. In other words, geographically and across all time, okay, and extending to every people group and every culture. That's the concept of Catholic, okay? In other words, it's not one little subset of people. It's not in one little time. It's across all time, space, all kinds of people, all the geography of the earth. Now, remember this. Jesus, in the Great Commission, in the various versions of the Great Commission or commissions we get, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's, you know, I mean, he's the one who has authority to sit at the right hand of the Father. Go, therefore, and make disciples of 
a few people in some really nice countries that y'all like a lot. Is that what he says? No, make disciples of all nations, right? And then he says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And remember, the Jews don't like Samaria. And to the ends of the earth. Okay? You know, and when you get to Revelation, when you get to Revelation, um, you see there, John has this vision of people from every tongue, tribe, and nation all worshiping. This is Revelation chapter 5, right? So um, what, what is going on here? Well, let's, let's look at this a little bit. Now, as far as the holy, the apostles understood this. It's all in the Bible. On the one hand, we're called to be, remember now, holy means set apart to God, right? Holy means to be set apart to God. So we are set apart to God. We are the ecclesia, or the ecclesia, the people who are called out to be new people unto God in Christ. That's, every Christian is called to be that. Paul opens his letters all the time saying to the saints at whatever church. And then he talks about, in many cases, all their problems and their you know, misdeeds and all <laughs> this kind of stuff. Well, what's going on? Are they saints or are they not? And they're sanctified because they're called out by God. They're set apart for God. And every Christian who's truly a Christian is in the Holy Spirit, okay? Robed in the righteousness of Christ and living in and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, did the apostles believe that every single person who showed up at a church gathering in a house or this, that, and the other thing was a born-again Christian? No. I mean, they know all these people who supposedly are Christians, and then they bail out, and then they turn other Christians in, or they, you know, they, they, they like it for about a year or two, and then they go a different direction, right? Or they marry somebody who doesn't like it, so they bail out. Or they start dating somebody who's not into it, so they bail out. Okay? Y'all know this, right? So, in other words, there's all kinds of people who claim to be Christians in the early church who aren't really Christian. Okay? Uh, but, like Jesus says, look, there's weeds and there's tares. You don't worry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll handle the division like when at the judgment, okay? But y'all are called to uh, follow this model of being the set-apart people in the church and reflecting the kingdom of God. So let's just look at some scripture that talks about the true people of God. Isaiah 62, 11 and 12. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Notice that. This is very Catholic. Catholic in the sense of universal. This is Isaiah. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him. In other words, this is the Savior coming, the Lord, and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. So this is the new Jerusalem. This is the true Jerusalem. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you... Christians, okay, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Do you hear that? A holy nation. A people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that, 1 Peter 2, 9, is echoing and pretty much pulling back in um, Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, when the Lord says, and unto me you shall be, he's speaking to Israel, the covenant people of Israel, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then he says to Moses, these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Jesus prays on the night before he dies for us on the cross. He prays to the Father and says, and for their sake I consecrate myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. So how are we made holy? Jesus makes that very clear. We're sanctified in the truth. And who ultimately is the truth? Jesus himself. Okay, that's the, that's the point of reference for everything we are to live our lives around. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we're sanctified in him, in accord with him, through him. Uh, just an example from Paul, 1 Corinthians, Chapter 1, verse 2. 
to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together, now notice this Catholicity reference, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter where you are on the globe, doesn't matter where you are in history, if you belong to Jesus, you're part of this holy group, uh, both their Lord and ours. Uh, let's continue with the Catholic Church emphasis for just a minute. Uh, in Acts chapter 10, Peter has this dream and then an understanding, this vision of, you know, the non-kosher food, and God is setting him up to then evangelize the house of the Gentiles, of Cornelius. Uh, you know, uh, he's, he's in Jaffa, Simon Peter is, but he's going to go up to Caesarea Maritima and preach the gospel to these Gentiles. So God is setting him up for this, and he says in response, um, you know, to, to when the Holy Spirit comes upon these Gentiles, he says, so Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand, this is Acts 10, 34 and 35, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now Isaiah and the other prophets have been pointing to this all in the Old Testament, you know, scriptures, and then it's, it, you, we see it being fulfilled in the New Testament. Uh, the Revelation 7, 9 passage, after this I looked and behold a great multitude, no one could number, from every nation, from, from all tribes and peoples, languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches in their hands. Uh, the communion of the saints is our coming together under one Lord. Uh, Jesus commands us to love one another the same way he loved us. Uh, Jesus calls us, let me go to Ephesians chapter 4, as this is a great passage, and a great passage to affirm. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. I therefore, Paul says, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner, where, there's that fiducia again, okay? Do y'all see that? That's fiducia. That's not just a census. It's certainly not just notitia. That is fiducia. That's living the faith. Uh, fides viva, okay? Uh, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. That's real communion of the saints' language. And then look at this. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. Okay, that means there's one church. Okay, the body is the church. Okay? There's one body and one Spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. What's our one hope? It's the gospel in Jesus Christ, okay? That's our one hope. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Everybody who belongs to Jesus is sanctified and joined together in the communion of the saints in the Catholic Church, the universal church, and we have one Father to whom we all pray, our Father, right? God, the Father. We have one Lord, Jesus. We have one faith that is reflected in the apostolic faith that is testified to, you know, infallibly, inerrantly in the New Testament scriptures and throughout the whole Bible, and that is clarified as far as basic points of structure in the creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. And for us as Reformed Christians, a lot of clarification as far as faith and application in the Westminster Standards. So that's, that's what you're looking at. Uh, it's, it's a gift to have, you know, structure to understanding our faith. And to, the, the creed is not, let me make this clear, the Apostles' Creed is not the infallible word of God. The creed points us back to the infallible word of God to understand what we are affirming in our faith that is scripture-based pointing to Jesus. And again, our faith, our faith is, for that matter, not in the creed. Our faith is in God the Father, in God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and in God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit 
brings about the forgiveness of sins made real in us. Okay? The Holy Spirit applies the atoning work of Jesus to us. The Holy Spirit brings us alive to profess the faith in which we are justified. Do y'all see what I'm saying? Okay, so in other words, does anybody have any question on that? So the whole, that's why these latter things about the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, how am I going to be raised? I'm going to be raised in the same, I don't have time to, I think I need to wrap up, but, but uh, the, Jesus is raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. The scripture tells us this. Does everybody with me on this? Okay. So by the same spirit through which Jesus was raised from the dead, you and I will also be raised from the dead. And you are professing faith that God is the same yesterday and today and forever. The Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead did not go to sleep, did not go into retirement, okay? Is not sitting in a beach resort, you know, on an island somewhere. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, God himself, the spirit of Jesus Christ, will raise you also in power from the dead. This is not going to be a whimper when you are raised from the dead. This is the act of God. And so you're saying that when you say, I believe in the Holy Ghost, man, you, you should be all in. So I hope that as we say these affirmations of faith, like on Sunday, y'all will get a little more excited about what you're saying. I mean, this is really great stuff. This is, this is the gospel. Good? You know, it's a, it's a good sermon, what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a sermon that tells us what yes. we believe. Yes, exactly. It's like a, yes. It's a, it's a very faithful theological sermon that takes you through what we believe, Carl. Yes. Yeah. So if you can say that with great confidence, then you're on solid ground. Yes. And if, there's, if there are things in, you know, conversely, if there are things in here that are like, well, I don't really understand that, or I'm not sure I believe that, we should talk and we should get you connected with the scripture and why it is not only we believe this, but why you really need to believe this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, let's, let's, let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for teaching us tonight and for the power of your word as testified to by uh, the classic Apostles' Creed and the Articles of Faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you guys for being with us.